right here. Let's welcome in uh, our main man, James Ham. James, uh, you've seen um, uh, as much or more Kings basketball than any of us. We were just going over some of the random players in NBA history who have lit up the Sacramento Kings. Mm. Uh, which ones come? We, we, we referenced Troy Daniels, eight threes in game winner. Um, I think that was 2018. We just yeah. looked at it. I can't remember. Yeah, it was 2018. Arco, Arco yeah. Uh, any, any randoms? Stick out to you? Yeah, Jason Smith. He's see, we didn't <laughs> reference Jason Smith. <laughs> Jason, Jason Smith, the, the the white guy, right? Like forward, <laughs> seven footer. Yeah, he would uh right like for the Hornets, I think. Pull up for like twelve footers and just he buried the Kings. I think eighteen points one night. I mean, Chris Boucher. We looked it up today. Chris Boucher had a thirty-eight and nineteen game, like one time, like against I, the Kings or just in general? not against the Kings oh. against someone else. That's like his career high is 38. But to allow like an almost 32-year-old rando dude to come off the bench and drop 24 on you, mm. it's so kings. And then look at all the guys that have done it so far this year. Every game there's, you know, the Garrison Matthews of the world or uh, what did we... Larson. Uh, yeah, Peel Larson. But the funny name? thing, it's not like this Kings team. It's like ingrained in the fabric of the Sacramento <laughs> Kings. It happened in the first game ever in Sacramento. <laughs> no, it did. The first game ever in Sacramento, Derek Smith blew up for 36 points. The Kings during that offseason gave up everything to get Derek Smith, RIP. And then he blew out his knee and was and was basically done. Like mm. he barely played. Um, but yeah, he's Jesus, the, we were doomed from the start. He is the original, the original bust you up. And uh, yeah, I, I, the randos, man, that's you always have to if you're a Kings player, a Kings team, you always have to look out for just some dude that has no business crushing your soul. We have we have broken this down into categories. There's the randoms. Hmm. There's the random randoms. Yeah. And then there's the who? And we have Boucher and Abaji as randoms. Larson yep. is a random random. And then we put, do you remember that Troy Daniels game? You were probably there where he had eight threes and hit the game winning three from like 29 feet. Yeah. Yeah, I think that so. Old Arco. Yeah. Yeah, I'm looking. I, I Just so people know, I, I'm the first game ever at Arco Arena, the first game ever that the Sacramento Kings existed Derek smith went 14 of 19 for the clippers scored 36 points <laughs> no joke like it, like <laughs> he set the standard right there and then the kings in that off season uh traded junior bridgman franklin edwards oh no they came with him they traded larry drew mike woodson a 1988 first round pick which ended up being hersey hawkins and a 2000 and 1989 second round pick uh for for uh Derek Smith who ended up doing absolutely nothing for the Kings. It was charismatic enigma says so it's all the curse of Derek Smith. It is. <laughs> no, I I fully believe it is a curse. Did you say God rest his soul? He's not with us anymore. Uh Derek Smith passed away at the age of 34 oh, in 1996. No. Oh, yep. Yeah. yeah. Not not well, great. Well, That's thanks for cursing the franchise, Derek, yeah. but rest in peace. The year before he came to the Kings, he averaged 22.1. And then in that the year that, well, okay, the year that he busted up the Kings, he only played 11 games, 23.5 points per game. One of them was at 36 against the Kings. Mm. Yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> Absolutely amazing. The Happened in the beginning. Goes back forever. Just random guys beating up the it's Sacramento part of Kings. the fabric part. of this of this franchise now. Forty years in Sacramento. Well, three, here we go. Three arenas. Forty years and Randos <laughs> beating the Kings ass. That's right. The good news is uh our, our our guy on Monday, I don't even know if he played. Remember it was uh Haywood Highsmith. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. I saw him on the bench. I don't think he got in the game. I said he was gonna get more than eight and a half points. He didn't did not so um speaking of monday this monday the insiders and d and kc will be live at 32 brew street at sky river casino uh james and kyle doing their show live for the very first time uh at sky river casino uh is a, a big kickoff to our canned food drive 
uh, if you plan on coming through, we'd really love to see you. We're going to watch Kings basketball beginning uh, at five o'clock when they take on the San Antonio Spurs. We plan on heading over to the humidor for some whiskey and yep, cigars. Yep, yep. Obviously, great food and drinks will be poured all day. But I'm really excited that James and Kyle get to experience that uh, at Sky River Casino. So if you normally show up 12, try to show up at 10 uh, and support James and Kyle, man. It's going to be a lot of fun this Monday. Veterans Day. Yes. On the holiday, we're going to be at Sky River Casino, man. So come uh, hang out. James and Kyle, the insiders kicking things off at 10 a.m. there at 32 Brew Street. Hammer, this is the first time uh, the Kings uh, have played an opponent a uh, second time this year. Um, first one was, it, it felt like the story of that game was uh, both three-point defense and lack of threes made on, on behalf of Sacramento, but they were still able to put up 128 points uh, in that overtime game. We saw videos from Sean, from De'Aaron, De and, and, and DeMar, Sean Cunningham with, with, with De'Aaron and DeMar. Both looked really focused on this one, man, and it kind of feels like they've, They've got to get back because they're the one and three and one. And DeMar was like, well, we, we feel pretty good, but four, four and one was there for us, and we kind of missed out on it. De'Aaron said the same thing. Yeah, I mean, realistically, the, the Kings should be riding a five-game win streak here coming home. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the should have, could have, would have. But I put that that Toronto game in a little bit of a different category. We talked about this last week. I mean, uh, that's a tough, you know, mm -hmm. loss to pin on somebody. Yeah. I don't, I don't know how else to, I mean, the, the travel was ridiculous. The, everything about it was ridiculous and you still took them to overtime. Um, you know, sometimes it, that's the way a game goes. Uh, I, I don't put that in the like horrible loss category. Sure. I, if you lose tonight, I would put it in the horrible loss category. Mm -hmm. This isn't a great team and it's not a great team missing like four rotational players. So at some point you have to be a team that, looks at a game like this, looks at your home win loss record, which is one and one at this point. And look, we got to be better. We got to go get this game. You know, we even talked about it on the insiders today with Kyle, like th the Kings won 48 games two years ago, 25 of those came on the road. So they were 23 and 18 at home and 25 and 16 on the road. That doesn't make any sense. This is a great crowd. It's always been a great crowd. Like whatever the problem is with this team winning on the road, I hope they figure it out. And I, I do know that like lately, at least the first two games, they did shoot in the main gym, which is something that I found very strange that they had not done over the last two years. Mm -hmm. They they always like do their shoot around in the practice facility. I don't know if they did that this morning or not. Um, it, it usually... It depends on whether the other team is it coming didn't in. Look like, it didn't look like it based on the videos. Sometimes what they'll do is they'll go shoot there and then they'll bring everyone over to the practice facility to do interviews because the other team is coming in. Oh, gosh. Gotcha. So it kind of depends on what's happening there. But still, like, I would have my team shoot in the gym where it sort of seemed like every other team that comes in shoots the lights out. And don't players prefer that? I think it depends like, uh, you know, they, they also like to be in their own, you know, they're in their practice facility all the time, mm -hmm. but I would rather like shoot on the rim. I'm going to shoot on during the game. Mm -hmm. That's sort of my way, my, my thinking on it. And we even had one game one day where I was there and buddy healed kept saying, Hey, something's wrong with the rim. I'm like, what are you talking about? And everyone's just kind of like looking around. Like, hey, the, the rim is wrong. Something's wrong with the rim. And we thought it was just buddy being buddy. And it turns out that, like, when they're wheeling the stanchion in, it, like, popped onto a little piece of wood, and it was off by just a smidge. Hmm. But Buddy Heald could could feel it while he was shooting. They had to pull the thing back out, like, clear out from underneath it, and wheel the, the stanchion back. But Buddy's a genius. Yeah, they they he's literally they genius. brought a tape measure out to measure, and they're like, "Oh no, he's right. There's something wrong with the rim." So I mean, that's like a one off where mm -hmm. something like that happens. But you would think that you'd want to be in the same gym where the sight lines are the same and the feel is the same. So I don't know. Yeah, I would, and I would say to that though too, um, they get a lot of time out there in the gym before the game like say they had shoot around in the practice facility mm -hmm. all those guys come out for warm-ups in the arena and then they got the team warm-ups they get time in the arena in the in the, in the gym yeah but it, I, I i'm with you though i if i could get into an an nba gym anytime i want to, i'd almost always want to shoot in the in the arena 
and and get my shots up that way. That's that yeah. would just be me. I think it's one thing to go in the practice facility and get, you know, 500 shots up on a on a Tuesday afternoon or something. It's a whole other thing when you're in game prep mode and and it's not just like, you know, the practice facility is huge. You could almost fit a whole a third basketball court in the practice facility. I bet you if you move the lines around you could. Mm-hmm. Like it's just a gigantic spot. Mm-hmm. You get into the the gym and it's, you know, all the seats are right there. Like everything's, the lighting is different. Everything is just different. Like even the practice facility is super, super like bright. Mm -hmm. That's not what the inside of when you, when they're playing on the main court, it's not super bright. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. Transitioning to the on the court stuff, Hammer, one thing we were talking about earlier being seven games into this, you know, topic of conversation from July 6th you know, all the way through that first game against the Timberwolves was, you know, shot distribution. Would one basketball be enough for everybody? Would uh, everybody be able to get their points, get their shots, get their opportunities? And it feels like seven games into this with uh, DeMar, Domas, De'Aaron, and Malik, everybody's eaten. Yeah. Uh, I think there are a couple of players that could probably, you know, still get a few more shots. Um, like I, I want Keegan Murray to take, you know, one or two more shots. I want, uh, Demonis Sabonis to get back to where he was like in the first week mm-hmm. where he's out there taking 14, 15 shots. Like, I think that that's a good spot for him, at least like the 13 and a half, 14 shots. And I think Malik is also a guy who hasn't really, really had like a full fledged sh- signature game. Um, but I told you guys this in the beginning, he's a guy who is always going to struggle here to like figure it out because he's the one who's had to play with different players the whole time. You know, the starters, it's like four dudes are on the court at all times. And maybe they're switching out Kevin Herter for Malik Monk or Doug McDermott. Right. But that second unit has been in flux the whole time. And they just didn't go out and get him the player. He needs like, there is not a lob threat for Malik Monk to throw a lob to. So that's, that's going to put him a little bit off kilter. And so it was like, his, his assist numbers are down. He's down about two points per game, um, you know, but overall, I think he'll be fine, too. It's just tough, like in order to uh, for everybody to get all the shots they want. Realistically, you need to play fl- faster. And sometimes you go up against a team like Miami that just puts the whole game in mud the whole time. And there's nothing you can do to speed it up. But I, I think that they'll figure it out. And I, I, they're getting better. You know, you can see offensively, they just keep getting more and more complete. And even in this last game, you saw where everybody had an opportunity to to have a big moment in like the final three minutes. Uh, you had the Malik dunk, um, you know, Keegan didn't, but uh, Domas has a putback. Damar hits the, the and one three. And the only reason they're in that game at all is because Fox put him on their, on his back during the third quarter and carried him to the, the fourth quarter and, and gave him a shot. Did um, when you, when you talk about um, Malik and, and, him trying to adjust to everything that's going on. I agree with you. I'd love to see him with a lob threat, but it looks like, and you probably see this too, he's he's starting to understand his spots to score are going to be in different places maybe they were the last couple of years. And you can see him almost in real time adjusting to that. Another thing I feel like they're doing a little bit more, and I could be wrong, but I just it feels like it, is they are making sure he's out there with some bonus a lot of the time. So like when you're doing the substitutions and all this other stuff, if you bring him a leak in, it's a bonus. will usually be in there because he doesn't have a finisher, um, you know, in Alex Lynn, or they may even go really small and have Trey Lyles out there. It feels like they always make sure that Monk is out there with some bonus. So they can try and get some of that um, pick and roll, pick and roll tandem going on. Yeah, I mean, they do it part of the time. You know, he comes in at the six-minute mark of the first quarter with Keon. That's mm-hmm. been, like, the standard rotation at this point. Mm-hmm. And and Sabonis plays most of the first quarter. Uh, they bring De'Aaron back in the final minute or two, and sometimes Sabonis sits then. Mm-hmm. Um, but then I they typically open the second quarter with Sabonis on the bench. And, and again, it's I uh, never want to make it sound like I, I think someone is doing something wrong. Like there's nothing Trey Lyles can do. He's just not a lob threat. You know, there it, it, same thing for Alex Lynn. It doesn't matter how tall Alex Lynn is, he would much prefer a bounce pass than a lob threat, uh, a, a like a true lob. 
Like even when he does get a lob, he usually catches it, lands, and then goes back up with mm-hmm. it. That's just, he doesn't feel comfortable doing it. Mm-hmm. And that's where, you know, like eventually you hope that maybe Isaac Jones or someone will step up and kind of be that type of player, but that's down the road. You know, last year they had uh, JaVale McGee. Um, you know, the years before that, guys like Chemezi Metu. Like that's a, it's a very different, different skill that some players have and some don't. A lot of guys don't feel comfortable going up in the air in traffic uh, for a lob, but then you have the, this set of group, this group of players that do have that skill set, and the Kings don't have one of them at this point. Uh, and and if they are going to have one, they're going to have to manufacture it. It's going to be like Isaac Jones learning how to play and then becoming that, because even that, I don't think he's a natural lob threat. Is that a, important enough of a skill set to work someone into a rotation like that? I mean, I... I, I'm not going to put a young player in that that position. Sure, but let's say. Well, if your favorite was still here, would you would you bail? Yeah, but let's say they had like Jackson Hayes, right? Okay. I mean, I think you know that that what Malik likes to do is is create and and be super. Uh, it's almost artistic on the floor, right? And having a player like that, that you can throw the ball, like it gets everybody excited. Mm -hmm. It builds on what he's already trying to build. Like the lob is a huge thing for fans. Like fans go. And that's why I think like De'Aaron Fox might be his best lob threat uh, right now and that we're seeing. And that's crazy, but that's the guy that sometimes he feels comfortable going to. Even Keegan Murray, if he can develop that. Um, But yeah, I I do think it's, uh, it's something that maybe you could teach a little bit. Um, but there are like super long athletic guys that just have that uh, in their bag mm-hmm. and it, and it's tough. I mean, the Kings still need like that type of player. They still need like a big man that can shoot a three and block a shot, maybe rebound a little bit, you know? So you're kind of looking around the league like, Hey, can you find one of those guys? I mean, John Collins is one of the great lob mm-hmm. threats. And I'm not saying to go get John Collins, but John Collins is an incredible lob threat. And he's one of those guys that you're looking at like, the on paper would look good, but then there's the twenty five, twenty six million dollars that he this year and next year that just makes him kind of like out of the price range. Mm-hmm. John Collins, when I've watched you talk a few times this year, he's actually played pretty good this year. Played really well. Yeah, I, yeah. I, like the price tag is a little tough, but I, I wouldn't mind seeing John Collins coming off the bench for this team uh, at the trade deadline. But uh, we talked about earlier. We talked about you know the, these guys and. Let me ask you a question first. How many times do you think Malik Monk led the Kings in scoring last year? Or if you already know. No, I don't know, but I would say eight. It's pretty damn close. It's pretty close. It was six. Yeah. How many times do you think he's going to lead the Kings in scoring (laughs) this year? Oh, I don't know. We put the number at five and a half, more or less. I went less. And it was seven. I think it was seven the year before. Seven I think it was six before. last year, seven the year before. I think I put it at less. I think it's significantly less. And I don't think that's a problem. I think it's going to be great. I just think it's more a testament to the guys that they have here now with DeRose and Sabonis and Fox. Yeah, I think it's interesting, too. If you go back and look at most of Malik's gigantic scoring output games, it almost always comes with a De'Aaron Fox giant explosion, mm-hmm. explosion game. I mean, even remember... In the 176, 175 mm-hmm. game, you know, Monk sets his career high with what, 45? Mm-hmm. And Fox had like 41. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah I mean, like, whatever it was, like, he, when one of them goes off, they, well, when Malik goes off, a lot of times Fox and him, like, do dueling banjos and they're both going. Up. I still think that there's going to be opportunity for him to be like that type of scorer again this year. Yeah. I mean, he had. 21 uh the other night you're, by the way your partner over at the uh, king's beat sean cunningham just noted kevin herter is uh available tonight for the second oh nice so after missing the last two miami and yeah, toronto two uh kevin herter is back of course we had doug mcdermott and then keon ellis <laughs> yeah i've got to get better at uh checking the injury report like all day long because i'm i'm assuming yeah it just it just came up on the injury report as I've, that's so tedious it's just like because there's a certain time it posts right and you just like refresh okay well, still the same it posts every hour but on the half hour yeah okay that's what it is 
So yeah, there was a one thirty, a two thirty, a three thirty, a four thirty, and a five thirty Eastern time. So the one at two thirty just came out, and he was on that one. I don't know if he was on the one thirty, but um, let me see. Just for sake of of mm-hmm. you know looking at the no, he was questionable at the, on the one thirty. Okay, just just upgraded to to uh, available, which is good. That's yeah, good for the Kings. Absolutely, that's very that's very good for them. Uh, but you were talking about Malik and, and the type of scoring outputs he could have this year. We did know he had 21 the other day. Like he, it's not like he's not scoring. Uh, we were just like, man, I, w- I wonder with the way that Demar is playing, with what De'Aaron is capable of doing, and the fact that Domas has had a great start to the season. Like, how many times would Malik lead the the team in scoring this year? Yeah, uh, I mean, it's going to be tough just because that's like that second unit right now is just it's not playing all that well. Like they're not firing on all cylinders yet. And you're starting, I mean, Mike has also only playing like three or four of them. Um, but you're waiting for that moment when they start to like gel a little bit and you're kind of waiting for Trey. And it's, it's also, again, I, it's the reason why I think all of us looked at the, the potential starting lineup and saw Keon Ellis as like a really nice potential starter with this, uh, with the, the, the other four mm-hmm. starters because he doesn't need a lot of shots. And also why we looked at Kevin Herter as a guy who could really find like a home off the bench as a, as a big time scorer. Um, and all of a sudden we're looking at this second unit and most, uh, if most, if not every night they've been outscored and like, you hope that that's not a huge issue down the road. But again, part of that's because Mike's playing like eight, eight and a half guys. And also that's probably, I think that might happen more times than not because of the, the the heavy hitters that you have, like mm-hmm. your, your starting lineup is better and is probably going to end up playing more. Like we, we talk about the, the between DeRozan, Fox, and Sabonis, and you might even throw Keegan in there. Two of the three or four are always going to be on the floor. So when Fox is on the floor or DeRozan's on the floor, they're going to be option number one. You know, so it's not going to be like. um Mason Jones, let's see what you can – can you give us 10 tonight? You know, you're going to get that many shot opportunities coming off the bench because the starters are, number one, so good, and there's always going to be at least two or three starters in there at all times. So I don't I don't know if you're going to get much bench scoring outside of Malik Monk and maybe Trey Lyles the entire season. Well, yeah, but I, I also think that at this point Mike's doing it out of necessity. Like DeMar DeRozan should not be playing 37.9, Keegan Murray 37.9, De'Aaron Fox 37.4, and DeMontis Sabonis 37. But I guarantee you, this if you look at the on-court, off-court, the second those guys step off the court, you're in trouble. Especially like Keegan Murray. The second Keegan Murray steps off the court, the Kings are in all kinds of trouble. Mm-hmm. Like his plus minus, like on the court, off the court, is wild. At least the last time I saw it, I mean, it was like a, a like a 24 point difference between him being on the court, the plus, and then minus when he's off the court. And I mean, it's just tough to replace a guy like that, um, especially when you don't have another guy who's built like him mm-hmm. that can do some of the things. So, uh, yeah, I, I think part of it is is just your second unit is, isn't commanding more minutes, um, but also like at, at a certain point, point, Mike is going to have to rely on those guys. And you might get to a point where if you do lose somebody to injury, where you just flat out don't have a player who's been playing very often, mm-hmm. and all of a sudden they're thrust into a role where they've got to play 24 minutes in a game, and they haven't played. They haven't played because that's the rotation that Mike's kind of going with early in the season. So I, I don't mind it while you're trying to gain momentum and trying to find your chemistry as a group, but 10, 15 games in, we need to see that number start to taper down. Um, who, you and, think it, who do you think it, it expands to? Jordan? Maybe, but I mean, I, I think we've all seen sort of their Jordan. I, I like him, but the limitations there, mm-hmm. like he's just not very big at all. Mm-hmm. And every time Mike does go to that lineup, it's usually a three guard set. And that makes it even tougher. Like you're running a three guard set with a guy who's, you know, 5'11. And like maybe the other team is having to adjust a little bit, but if the other team starts playing matchups and starts hunting. There's nothing Jordan McLaughlin can do to, like hang out with a six foot eight dude. Mm. Yeah. He looks even smaller than, uh, than I originally thought when he's out there. 
He looked he looked like a little guy out there. But I love his IQ. I love the way he shoots the basketball. Um, and he's just one of those guys that I, I don't think he's gonna beat you, or excuse me, I don't think he's gonna hurt you um due to doing something that he shouldn't or not understanding where to be. Like he always knows what he's supposed to be doing out there and where he's supposed to be. I like uh, his minutes that I've seen so far, but to your point, James, it could be a matchup problem sometimes um, if you don't have the right lineup along out there with him. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I, I'm looking at the numbers just so we're I'm, I'm being accurate here. Uh, when Keegan Murray is on the court, they have an offensive rating of 120 and a defensive rating of 106.3. So he's a plus 14.41 when he's off the court. When he goes off the court, the Kings' offensive rating goes from 120 to 105. Their defensive rating goes from a 106 to a 130.8. When he's off the court, the Kings are a negative 25.1. So on the court, if we if we match that, when he's on the court, they're plus 14. When he's off the court, it's a negative 25. There's a 39.2 difference with him on the court and off the court. A plus, he's a plus 39.2 on court, off court. That is wild. <laughs> and that's that's offensive rating. That's like offensive, defensive rating. His net rating is basically that. So, Damn. yeah. So Keegan has to play 48 minutes a game. 48 minutes every game. And if he does that, you'll win every game. That's right. I mean, it's math. It is. It's basic. Like, it's like, it's, come on, anybody could do this. It is basic algebra. Yes. Well, we figured out that. So, can you? Can someone get a hold of Mike and just tell him? The like, only, hey, we've got this whole thing figured out. I'm telling you that the only the the easiest way to fix this entire problem is to go get a second Keegan Murray. And this oh, is easy work. Easy work. This is the only time in the NBA where I think we can say right now that there literally is a second Keegan Murray out well. there. <laughs> there is a second one. Go get the other one. Go get the uh, and it's gonna be tough. But you know what? Do you got to give up? I, I don't know. Blazers get, aren't yeah, get, get him out of here. I like that. Yeah, get him out of here. Come on, go go get Chris Murray. Put him on that lineup. Uh, like, put your training staff to work. Is is Chris? Is he? I mean, I mean, he's not as good as Keegan. Like, what is Chris really good at? Well, like, look, I'm gonna point out very specifically. First of all, he's a year behind in development because he stayed in college mm -hmm. for a year. Mm -hmm. Secondly, look at the what the Kings have done with Keegan Murray's body over the last two years. So Chris is a year behind in that development. Mm -hmm. But also, I don't think the Blazers are doing what the Kings did. They're not investing yeah. nearly as much time and energy into developing him mm -hmm. um, as they, they probably should be. Because look at the transformation and... Like these are identical twins. Like they're not going to be identical with everything, yeah. but there is a way. And I, I've told you guys this before. Like when the Kings drafted Keegan, they I, one of someone within the organization told me both of the Murray twins are have very young bodies. They grew late. They they were late bloomers. And there's a lot you can do with with players that come into the league like that, as opposed to. Like, look at LeBron James came into the league at like six eight two fifty five, right? Mm -hmm. There, you they stacked muscle on him, and he's been he's gotten better, but he's still basically the same human being he was when he came in. He had already grown; he was already a full grown man at probably sixteen or seventeen, mm -hmm. and like not like a what we're normally talking about, like a full grown man. He was like a full grown, like twenty five, twenty eight year old man. And like, but as a 16 year old kid, mm -hmm. that's where I think the Murray's they took longer to get there. And you see that a lot. I mean, what was it? David Robinson mm -hmm. grew like almost a foot while he was at the, in the Naval Academy. Mm -hmm. He went from like six, one to seven, one. And it was like, they're like, what in the world just happened? And you see that a lot. You also see a lot where players are like, they've got guard skills. It's like, well, cause I was a point guard until I was 17 and I grew seven inches. <laughs> And now I'm a, a power forward or a center in the league. And they, I was convinced that was going to happen to me, that I was going to grow like five inches my like junior to senior year. That didn't happen. When I was in eighth grade, I don't grade, think I've grown since my freshman year. 
I kind of feel the same way for me. When I was in eighth grade, I was power forward. Yeah. yeah I, I thought I was going to be like, uh, uh, who's a power forward that just gets the rebound and goes, like LeBron. I didn't think I was going to be as good as LeBron. You hear this guy? <laughs> I assume it be LeBron. <laughs> well, I'm yeah, saying, LeBron, yeah. no, just the, that's the style of play. I get the rebound, go coast to coast. That's what I used to do all yeah. seventh and eighth grade year. You, hey, you hear this, right? I Dude, I was cutting the podcast. You made me put my headphones on. I used to be Allen Iverson at one point. <laughs> no, that's when I stopped growing. That's when I turned. When I was no longer growing and I wasn't a power forward, that's when I had to turn into AI. Yeah. I was, uh, when I was a freshman in high school, I was five foot tall. I weighed 95 pounds. I grew 10 inches in high school and another inch out of high school. Really? I was tiny. And my youngest? I was going to say, yeah. Up until uh, like a, like 10 months ago, he was like a little chubby. I mean, he's a, a dude that like went through the pandemic, plays video games all the time. Mm -hmm. And he grew only six or seven inches and lost 20 pounds. Damn. All yeah. Right. As as Chris though, Chris will tell you I was LeBron of that league. Oh, you're still on that. No, it's the fact I would try to think of somebody who could a co-sign. As Chris, text him right now. Text uh, who? Uh, Chris what? who? Oh yeah, I can't really be saying his name. But text text our boy. Be like, yo, was was he the LeBron of the, of the basketball league? <laughs> he'll be like, yeah, he probably. He hey was. man, do you remember? He was kind of LeBron however many years ago, if Kenny was just dominating <laughs> your guys' league. <laughs> no, not to mention I don't know. I'm just. Do you want me to text every Chris in my phone? Well, no, the only Chris that would know. Reda said redacted. School. Redacted. Oh, that Chris. Oh, well, yeah. WCW. Yeah, I don't want to get him in trouble. Uh-oh. No. Uh, Why be... are they talking about you again? God <laughs> damn it. No, that Somebody was shut him up. That was damn That's crazy. That's funny. Uh, yeah, no, he'll, he'll, he'll be like, no, he was kind of Bron Bron. He was kind of Bron Bron. Okay, I'm not, I'm not texting and asking that. I'm just absolutely not. Got it. You know, I know I'll text I'll text them and be like, hey, who, who, did, who did Kenny remind you of when you guys played Little League basketball or whatever? I'm not even gonna ask if you were brought. Yeah, send that. That's the text right there. He's That's gonna say Greg Odin. The high school Greg Odin. High school Greg Odin. That's true. That hey, college Greg Odin was incredible. Greg Odin looked 40 at Ohio State. <laughs> Yeah, he looked like that today. Like Greg Oden looked exactly the same. I feel like I saw Greg Oden not too long ago. Like I think they did something ago. on him. Uh, it, they, I, I, I don't, I don't know if they were like filming something. I don't remember if it was E60 or what it was. Mm. It was just this, this, this one scene. He was on campus. Mm. I don't remember the school. I don't remember if it was Ohio State or something, uh, a different school. But he was on campus at a school, and he walks by this lady. It's all, it's all older. <laughs> It's an older white lady, right? Uh -huh. And she looks up at him and she goes, are you a basketball player? And he goes, no, I used to be, though. And it was just like hard. It was like, oh, that's, mm. oh, that's kind of tough. Greg yeah, it's kind of tough. And then he just went along his way. Hey, he had really tough. Like he uh, struggled with alcohol and everything else after because mm -hmm. his body just like gave up on him and like losing like who you are as yeah. a person. That's tough. Yeah, that's, that's it's crazy. Greg, you're better at this. Both of you are. Greg Oden, Mike Conley, same league, same year. Yeah. Oh yeah, they're Freshman team. Class, yeah, right. college teammates. Ohio Went State to uh, the national championship. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Oden was nasty. Yeah, he was bad. Yeah, he was bad. Uh, I just remember like that's crazy that him and Mike Conley were on the same Ohio Conley. State squad, and we haven't seen Greg Oden in ages, yeah. a decade. Yeah, they at least. Um, more. Uh, and, and we see uh, Mike Conley all the time because he still plays, but I'm always always reminded because Reese is upset that Rob Dillingham doesn't play more, and he, he mm. says, just put him in there for Conley. Mm. I was like, well, wait a minute. Dillingham's like 19. Let, let and his argument is, yeah, Conley's like 42. <laughs> but that's there. how I always know because he, he checks. It. He's, oh, Rob didn't play today. Chris Conley, I, Mike Conley played a lot, though. Yeah, he's gonna play. Still cooking, Mike Conley. Just signed an extension, didn't he? Then he signed an extension. Mike like Conley did. Yeah, like last year, I thought I he got he a signed, contract extension. Yeah, two years. Yeah, hey, he's thirty-eight. Mm. Yeah, he's still a good ball player. He absolutely is. Yeah. He's important to what they're doing. Uh, we'll come back. Uh, James Hammond, the insiders, here with us. The Sacramento Kings. Take on the Toronto Raptors tonight uh, at the Golden One Center. Kevin Herter is available to play uh, for the Sacramento Kings, so we'll talk about all of that as Dilo and Casey continue here 
on Sacramento Sports Leader ESPN 1320. It's always funny because we'll be like, Mike Conley, yeah, great basketball player, hell of a career, all that stuff. And Reese is like, yeah, this dude's like about to collect Social Security. What are you doing out here? <laughs> it's the play, Rob. That's funny. So here's my little guy when he got his driver's license, which he was <laughs> a little over 16. That's crazy. He does not look okay. 16. Not at all. <laughs> and here he is like eight months later. <laughs> That's crazy. Oh, wow. That is a trip. It doesn't even look like the same. Nah, thing. <laughs> not at all. Yeah. He grew out of 25 pounds. That whole kids growing up thing is wild. Yeah. Absolutely. And, he, and he's not done growing. Well, I thought I wasn't either. It turns out, no, you're good. You're all done. Yeah. <laughs> And then my, my oldest was, man, six foot tall, close to a six foot tall and 145 pounds when he was seventh, eighth grade. Big boy. That's cool. Malia just created our, our ads for Matt Trisha. He's pretty neat. Shout out, Malia. Go get the D-Lo stack. Get your hey, supplements. Hey. Get your D-Lo stack. Oh, can you mute us for a sec? Yeah. Hello, everybody. And that's why Kenny punched him. <laughs> and then Kenny punched him. Back here with James Ham at the Insider. James like Sexy Red. You see him bopping over there? Oh, James, James likes Sexy Red. Sexy red, it is. sexy red do make people move. I say that or leave, move or leave, one or the other. No in between with sexy red. You don't need to move or leave. Um, James, if I showed you a picture of sexy red, would you know it was her? Nope, I didn't think so. Actually, up until the point you said her, I would not have known if it was a man. <laughs> Oh man. Oh man. That's Come terrific. On, man. Shout out James Ham. James and the Insiders <laughs> will be live at 32 Bruce Street at Sky River Casino this Monday. This Veterans Day. Uh come through, hang out. We would love for you to be with us. Of course, we'll be doing our show live as well. It's a full day of ESPN out there at Sky River Casino, leading right into uh the Sacramento Kings game beginning at five o'clock. So uh, the insiders and Jiffy Lube doing some things together out there at 32 Brew Street at Sky River Casino. 
Uh, if you can bring some canned food with you, man, that would be awesome. We're kicking off our canned food drive uh, in preparation for the holidays. Uh, we do it with KSFM. Uh, we do it across all of our radio stations here. So uh, if 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 you if you guys have the means, if you have the ability, if you just have some things laying around the house that you know you're not going to get to, man, clear that cupboard out. Bring it to us. Uh, we'll get it to people uh, who can utilize it. Again, that is this Monday, this Veterans Day. Uh, you're not working. Come see us. Come see us. 32 Grove Street, Sky River Casino. Two live shows and a basketball watch party. Yeah. Cigars, whiskey, and food. Come on, man. <laughs> Come on, man. Plus, the new Aaron is going to be there. Oh, yeah. So you guys got to make us look good. Where you do we, we need y'all to show out. Where you do and Casey told gear. Guys a couple weeks ago, I need everybody there. Yeah, need everybody there. We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna ask two two big favors. Uh, we'll ask the other one on November 11th. So let's just get through the first favor first, and then we'll get to November 11th. Uh, so come see us, uh, Kings Raptors tonight. We talked a little bit about uh, Kevin Herter returning, uh, missed the last two games. How how much does that do for the offense when Kevin Herter is out there? Obviously, Doug McDermott started the first game. He was out. Not really a big threat. Kings put up points. Keon Ellis started the second one. Of course, that's the Miami Heat. That was a little bit more of a kind of grind it out, tough it out, t- slugfest type game. Uh, how much does does Kevin Herter's presence on the floor uh, change the way that those those four guys can play on offense? I think it changes everything. I mean, that's what we're seeing so far. And that's not, again, it's not an indictment on anyone else. It's just that, hey, Kevin Herter's played really well. And the Kings have played really well with Kevin Herter. They adopt, uh, like adapted very quickly to him being back on the court. That's because a lot of players have played with him a bunch, but look at the two man game that we've seen with him and, and Domas. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think it's been great. I think one of the reasons why we we've seen Domas, uh, his points per game tail off the last couple is because they're not able to get in that two man game with, uh, with him and Kevin. So, um, like, look, I, I think this is, he, he's giving you what, what he did two years ago and it's early. Um, but that's what we're seeing so far. And, you know, he makes a ton of sense with that roster, especially with the, with DeMar and with uh, Domas not shooting enough threes. Although I think both of them are doing their best to get their number up. I think, you know, between the two of them, they're, they're like a little over five a game. Speaking of the threes, are you, um, are you worried at all about the overall three point shooting uh, that this team has, has had in the preseason and now, into you know the regular season do you think this is kind of who they are or is this just a blip on the radar they'll get up uh, you know eventually to where we normally see them from a percentage clip yeah i think that they're going to get up to a higher percentage like i i haven't done the math but i think if you take away like the one really weird 0 for 11 from fox um you would see as a team that they their number goes up and anytime you're looking at like a seven game sample size it's really tough like how like how everything changes so quickly i mean we can talk about the kings being one of the worst like defensive three point uh teams against uh defending the three and the kings are 19th you know so there are a bunch of teams that are worse um as of right now clearly the kings need to do better than 33.1 percent from three um but even saying that they're 24th which means a lot of teams are starting off slow shooting the the three ball. Um, yeah, I, I think they'll be okay. Uh, I I think Keegan Murray is a much better shooter than what we've seen so far. And his like 30, is he shooting 30.2% right now? I think Fox is going to bump his percentage up by 5% uh, and be around 35, 36. Uh, I expect Keegan to be 36, 38 at least. And so you're, you're looking at all these numbers, even Malik Monk, probably closer to 34, 35% on the year. Um, I think everybody's got a little bit more to give. Uh, you're just trying to, you know, find everybody, uh, you know, get everybody in their rhythm. Safe to say you're worried a little bit more about the three-point defense than the three-point shot making? Yeah. I mean, again, like, look, these things swing wildly from one game to the next, right? And, you know, I think we all got concerned about it in the preseason, because the Warriors came out and hit the Kings with 29 threes in that first game. Number one, the Warriors have now done that to everybody all the way through the season. They're they're bombing threes at like an alarming clip. So that's who they were. They are. But if you remember the next game, the Kings held them to hardly anything. So I mean, you're gonna have good time, uh, good moments and bad moments. 
just remember that as this team, like, again, we always talk about them simmering the pot, and we always think about that on the offensive end. Realistically, the defensive end is going to be worse than the offensive end. It's going to take longer for that organic growth to happen, the rotations to happen. There's a lot more going on on the defensive end because the ball's not in play. Like, sure, you're chasing the ball a little bit, but when you have the ball, there's always like a very distinct, hey, you go stand in the corner, you go here. Like the offensive side of the ball, everyone wants to play that side of the ball and they and they get better really quick. The defensive side of the ball, it just takes longer. It takes longer for new players that haven't been together to like move in unison. And we've seen moments where they do. Um, but like overall, like there, there are some clear things. The Kings, uh, they can defend the three better. Um, offensive rebounds we heard about in the crash zone mm-hmm. nonstop, and then it's non-existent in, in the regular season. And this team is 24th in the league in offensive rebounding. Those are things where you're you're just kind of looking like, okay, th- this is going to take a little while, mm-hmm. but then go back to the final play against um, against Miami. How many guys crashed? Everybody. Yeah. Everybody. And and I agree with you know um, the numbers, but the numbers don't bear out like what I feel like I'm seeing. Like I don't feel like they're one of the lower teams in offensive rebounding. It feels like they're getting a lot of tip outs and second chance opportunities. And I know you had mentioned that's was one of the points of emphasis coming out of training camp. I feel like they've done a good job with that. But I mean, the numbers kind of say differently, but I don't know. It just it feels like they're doing a good job. Keegan Murray seems to get in there a lot, you know, on some offensive rebounds. Maybe just just sticks out, you know, to me when it actually happens as opposed to it happening a lot. Yeah. And I think if we looked, um, we are seeing things like you know, they're not giving up a bunch of fast break points, even though they are still crashing the glass as much as they can. Mm -hmm. But some of the guys, I mean, I've seen players just not go in and do it. And it's like, hey, that's not going to fly. If Mike watches a tape or if he's standing right there watching, there's there's only a couple of times you're going to get that where you're not doing what you're being asked. Mm -hmm. And that's to fly in and try to crash. And so I think that they're still trying to figure that one out. And and it, you know, like, look, this is every team in the league is is to a certain degree struggling, except for like the Cleveland Cavaliers and the Oklahoma City Thunder and maybe the Golden State Warriors who are playing like way over their head. Um, everybody else seems to be, you know, like around the same level. I mean, the Eastern Conference having like no no teams at 500 or above, like it's just what are they at there? We've got two teams above 500 Cleveland in the Eastern and Boston. Conference. That's it. That's crazy. The rest of them, uh, there's only three more teams that are that are <laughs> at 500. Ridiculous. Yeah, that's wild. Everyone else is under 500, and you go to the West, the top 11, the top nine teams are all four and three or better, and then you got Memphis at four. Kings and four. three seed in the East. <laughs> hey, do away with conferences. <laughs> they're tied for the four seed right now, so like we can't look at where they. I mean. It's wild what's happening. Yeah. Um, I mentioned this earlier, wanted to, to, to pay this off. Uh, the Sacramento Kings have been great at getting to the foul line this year. Uh, obviously the best that I think any of us can remember uh, them being, of course, DeMar DeRozan likely paying a huge part in that. If it feels like there's a few more frequent whistles in the association this year, it's because there are. Last year through January, there were 19.6 fouls per game with 22.9 free throws per game. By the end of the season, when there was that shift in officiating, that number went down to 17.6 fouls per game and 20.1 free throws per game. So far this season, the average number of fouls per game is 20.8, with free throws being at 23.8. Hmm. So considerably more. Yeah. Yeah. And I I think what we've seen too is And if, still Domas can get punched in the face and not get to the foul line. It's fascinating. Play on. It doesn't play matter. On. It doesn't matter what the officials are doing. Domas has never been fouled before. I don't understand how they didn't review that. You have a player who's bloodied, who it wasn't just his, I mean, his nose and mm-hmm. his lip are both cut. Mm-hmm. How you don't go back and look at it. And look, I don't think Bam intentionally punched him in the face right that doesn't matter the nba rule says it doesn't matter whether it's intentional or not we got to go review it's a blow to the head Mm -hmm. 
and it's a flagrant. He had two of them. The other one was on the the rebound where he flew in and hit him in the temple. Yeah. That's not okay. I was watching the Suns, the Suns 76ers game the other night. And uh Ubiselli pump faked uh underneath the basket and Grayson Allen tried to fly in for a block and was going to land on his back or jump over the top of him. Instead, he put his knee out and kneed uh Ubiselli right in the back of the head. And they went back, they reviewed it. Gave him a flagrant one and said, hey, like, what are we doing here? And it looked like he was going to fly over the top of him. And then at the last second, kind of got a little nervous about that, pulled his knee in and his knee clocked him right in the back. Mm. It's flagrant. And they go to the tape. They look at it. They're like two shots in the ball. How do you not do that with Demonis Sabonis? Like, and I, I'd say early in the season, he has not been hitting the head nearly as much as he had been before. But you go into that heat game, and it was vicious. At least three times he got it hit. It seems hard. like blood should trigger a replay. <laughs> Just a little bit. Just a little bit. <laughs> He's he walked off of the floor with blood on his lips. <laughs> Maybe we guys, let's look into this. Well, that and you poor can, guy did a DJ Moore. Just walked, Just walked off. <laughs> you can go back and review that Keegan Murray's shot was after the shot clock, but you can't go back and look at that in real time. Like, why is that not going to Sakakis? And why are they not reviewing that while the game keeps going? It's clear. Hey, like, Pam, just do a stiff uppercut to Domas. Maybe yeah. send him to the line. The, the crazy thing is, now that you mention all this, I don't think Domas has ever received a flagrant foul. Like, something happened to him. Good. and it, Like, not since he's been in Sacramento. We've seen black eyes. Mm-hmm. We've seen everything. Not once. It was, yeah, that's that's two shots. In well, the, ball, the stomp might have got him. I can't even remember what the stomp was ruled. Oh, they threw him out. It was a flagrant two, and they threw him out. Ah, okay. I got okay. one. So we got, got one. one. Okay, but you remember he had to stomp on his chest. Yeah, yeah. Keegan Murray getting a flagrant <laughs> in front of the commissioner in the playoffs <laughs> yeah. for it to count. And it took about twenty minutes. Yeah, well, yeah. They weren't sure. <laughs> Draymond incited a riot while they were reviewing it. Yeah, um, and in the play, I mean, in his rookie season. Keegan Murray got call, called for a flagrant for hitting, uh, for a knee bumping uh, Stephen Adams in in the little Stephen Adamses. Yeah, yeah, the Kiwis, mate. Yep. <laughs> and he checked to make sure they're all there and counted, <laughs> counted three. <laughs> like one, two, three. <laughs> yeah, they're all we're all good. But like, how are you able to call that? But when someone gets like realistically punched in the face. Mm -hmm. And again, intent doesn't matter. Intent matters for a flagrant two, Mm -hmm. but for a flagrant one, that doesn't matter. Dude got punched. Crazy. He got roughed up in that game. I can't believe they really called me for that foul. I was just playing defense. (sighs) They called me. (laughs) (sighs) That was Keegan. (laughs) No, we know. We know what it was. It was like what, Keegan, you know, if you worked in a cubicle. James talks so all the time. That does sound like Keegan. That's Keegan. Are you proud of yourself when you leave here? <laughs> Do you feel like you did good? <laughs> there are people in the parking lot. Boo that man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, that was a component of that game we didn't talk nearly that was, that enough about. That game super physical. I love it. I love watching it. Well, and for Domas to still kind of be like, F it, and we, we got to get this win, and he's fighting through everybody to get that damn rebound at the end of the game and still get that little flick shot in to give him the win. Ah, oh, what a great shot. He's got it. Like, he'll never get credit for it. He's one of the toughest players in the league. Oh, yeah. It's oh, tough. yeah. Tough as nails. Yeah, yeah. He'll, he'll never get, like, acknowledged as right. such, but, like, he is he is tough. Right. And it's it's one of those things, too, where, like, Maybe it's just the Bay Area. I mean, like, oh, Sabonis, he's so soft. He's, he's like the the furthest thing from that. Like, it, it. Listen to the people that play against him. You know, not just the fans that just watch him on NBC Sports Bay Area. Listen to the people that play against it. Like, oh man, that's that's a long. They night. talked about that on Starting Five, if I remember correctly. Like mm-hmm. how physical he is, and how physical it is. Uh, how physical. Uh, people are with him because he's so strong. He had that. I think it was on Mon- on yeah Monday. He had. It's a signature. It's something he always does. It wasn't yeah. like this super standout play, but sometimes like he's in the paint, and he's pump faking and trying to get around, trying to get around, and then he'll just give this elbow into this 
stomach of the other player and wrap around it like he'll dig in and catapult to the other side of the basket with this elbow just right in their kidneys. And it he does it all the time. And I'm like, that doesn't seem like it's fun. Well, it's like the uh, the DeMar DeRozan move, which is so subtle. He dips his shoulder into somebody and then comes right up and in, like into his jump shot. Mm. So he creates this little bit of separation, not with an arm, but with his shoulder. And he's been getting away with it forever, so they don't call it. Mm-hmm. But that's how he gets that little tiny bit of separation. And by the time you close out on him, he's already up and, and it's too late to actually block him. And that's why a lot of times he gets foul calls. It was good to have one of those guys on the squad. Yeah. <laughs> feels good. I ain't going to lie. It feels good. I mean, tomorrow we going through there, doing all this, <laughs> falling back. They give him the – oh, cool. It's, it's our guy. Yeah, there we our go. Guy. Yeah, yeah. Feels our guy. good. Feels good. No, yeah. what feels good is having a guy who can go get a bucket as quickly right. as he can. That's right. I think yeah. we were talking about this with the last Toronto game, Hammer. Like, they're, they're down, you know, eight, nine, ten points, whatever it was, with a handful of minutes left, and they can't hit the three. But it's just either DeMar taking the ball out of the basket or them getting a turnover and going to the rack. And at first I'm thinking they can't – they're not – they can't catch up. They're not going to be able to score enough twos. Like, they can't catch up. But they – you know, they got a, a stop here, a stop there, and they were able to get up the floor so quickly. And if DeMar wasn't getting to the foul line or De'Aaron wasn't getting to the foul line, they were getting a basket and wound up pushing that game to overtime. And that's just – like, that. that is – it's such a – it's why they went to get DeMar DeRozan. For 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 moments like that, like we need a play, we have to have a play. Everybody knows last year. Everybody knows it's going to be the Aaron. It might be Malik. Well, now now you've got to guard everybody. Well, that and I, I think for as much as I didn't like the play at the end of the Toronto game, the three pointer that uh, like Demar threw up with like eight seconds left, where it was six seconds left. It looked like the Kings were just about to get into an offensive set to try to give him a shot. Yeah. And then Boomy hoists it. And everyone's like, we weren't ready for that at all. There's no way for us to get a rebound because we didn't know what was going up. But then he does it the next game and he gets not only does he hit it, but he gets the foul. Mm-hmm. And you're like, seriously, Dan, like, that's crazy. <laughs> yeah. the, like in a four point game, you go and get an and one three yeah. and tie the game is like, oh, all right. I mean, you, you do. You got one of those dudes all of a sudden. Yeah, he's he's a treat to watch. Yeah, I, it's only seven games in. I'm like, but that's the oh, he with us. We got really good players here, mm-hmm. like, and that's where you're trying to get kind of a. All right, they're four and three. Like, what does this season really look like? Like, they got good players here. Like, obviously, Demar is really good. Like, De'Aaron's good. Domas is having a great start to the season. Malik is good. Keegan's. You've gave us the numbers on Keegan. Like, it really does feel like this is a good basketball team. I totally agree. I just feel like there's that one extra piece because again, I, my problem isn't so much what you have right now. It's that in order to do what they're doing, they're playing 37 minutes a night and that's out of necessity for me. Like I'm looking and you can say, Hey, we'll give Malik some more minutes, give Kevin some more minutes. That's not the position you really need more minutes at. You need to find a way to get, somebody that can help them out like as a a four or five or a a three four whatever it might be and that's i think going to be the challenge from here on out it's like how do you get like again look at what this team would look like that dorian finney smith Mm. you know and and that's not just some massive upgrade it's just one other dude that can go out there and defend somebody else so keegan doesn't have to play 37 minutes a night and it's tough maybe you can find that guy maybe maybe a jay crowder you bring him in see if it works um, but I still think the Kings need just that one more piece and, and maybe, you know, again, someone that can block shots if, if you could find it, but, um, it's tough. You gotta, you know, that's going to take draft capital or you don't have a bunch of other ways to do it. And maybe you could use a mid-level exception and absorb some of the salary into that. But, um, uh, yeah, it's just complicated. Yeah. Um, real quick. Just because this came across my timeline, I know you'll appreciate this. Well, well, we didn't talk about this. Those two layups from John Morant the other night were two of the most amazing shots I've ever seen. Did you mm-hmm. see yeah. them both? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh my god! Yeah. Like usually, Jesse will appreciate this, but usually, like somebody will do something and like, don't ever show me Michael Jordan's switch hand layup again. I'm mm-hmm. like, all right, young buck, settle down. Those two. Yeah, that, <laughs> I'm not sure how he pulled that That's off because he reversed crazy. and then switched hands too, right? Oh yeah, that was that was insane, man. He that set it crazy. up with the dunk. 
he first he had the big dunk, mm -hmm. and then everyone's trying to sky for the dunk, and then he's like, oh no, I'm going to show you mm -hmm. something new. And he did it twice. Oh yes, yeah, was crazy. Uh, and and they, hey, they did lose by one. Thank you. Shout out to Brooklyn. <laughs> Shout out to Brooklyn, Brooklyn in the house. Do. Um, what you think happens tonight, man? I, I'm I'm on I'm on wax saying uh, I think the Kings, I think they get their get back, and I think they beat the Raptors comfortably. Comfortably, the the Raptors have good basketball players i don't know if they're a good basketball team but they have talented players but i think the kings are there's a level of focus me and damien have kind of been seeing from this team where i don't think they're gonna mess around with the raptors tonight yeah they need to not mess around with the raptors this is a game where man you got to get better at home like mm -hmm. you you got to go out there and you got to punish a team and especially one that just got you mm -hmm. you know and i don't think what what you saw in that raptors game so little of what they did was repeatable. Mm -hmm. Like again, uh, Grady Dick is is going to score. He's a good he's a good shooter. He's going to score. But you can tighten up the defense there. And there's a big difference between Kevin Herter and Doug McDermott defending Grady Dick coming out out uh, off the jump, right? Yeah, yeah. Like there is a big difference there. And you know, if if it's not working, you can go to rely on Keon Ellis some more. But what you can't do is allow a guy like Chris Boucher to just go crazy on you. Like just figure out who it is, look at their team and go, who is going to try to have like one of those nights and just try to snuff it out. Like, don't let that happen. Yeah. And oh. uh, yeah, I, oh. I think they, they will win handily. Well, or don't let two randoms do that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like Abaji and Boucher can't go crazy. How yeah. does that happen? I don't know if you guys know though, the first game after a road trip. <laughs> well, that's a good point. I don't want to hear anymore. That's a good point. No Tough. More. Well, it is what it's no life more. in the NBA. It's a built in loss, really. No more. So when the Kings return after going four and four, <laughs> we can look ahead to Los Angeles because you know these these damn first home games after a Okay, seriously. It's just us. You think that gets said tonight? Slow, yes. slow start gets does that well you won't know you you'll you'll be there i won't know but i will say yes it does <laughs> <laughs> somebody will say it oh yep. you know it's always scary the first game after a long road trip it's like somebody will i i get it but come on that this is not the there, game. that that cannot possibly that can't be a thing that i just we have to eliminate that <laughs> the first game back from a road trip at home no what no, that's ridiculous. <laughs> that's ridiculous. Not doing that. I, I, I'm, I'm ready to get rid of it, too. If they all slept on Matthew's mattress, mattress. <laughs>